Ten a quarter, ten a quarter, ten a quarter, ten a quarter, ten a quarter. My name is Hannah Brayton, and it's my immense pleasure to be blinded by a projector. Um, uh, but no, but to welcome you all here on this balmy, uh, subtropical Wellington evening. Um, to have hopefully um, our hearts and minds warmed um, and challenged by the presentation we have this evening by Professor Juan Cruz from the Royal College of Art in London. Uh, it's an extreme pleasure for me to be able to welcome Juan um, to Aotearoa, New Zealand, his first visit here, but also we've known each other for nigh on 20 years, which when we added up was very frightening. Um, so I first worked with Juan on uh, my graduating um, MA uh, degree show at Goldsmiths Exhibition, um, where we invited artists to respond to the collection of South London Gallery, and Juan made an, a very beautiful textbook work, which I still have on my bookshelves. <laughs> it still exists in circulation. Um, so it's, it's, it's a special personal pleasure as well as a professional one to welcome you Juan. Thank you so much for making the journey. Um, tonight kicks off uh, subsequent two days of um, the Art School of the Future Symposium, which I know a good number of you are going to be attending. Um, but for those of you who just become so enraptured in the conversation tonight and you desperately need to come tomorrow, it is still possible. So please come and see either myself well, the lovely Simon Mark is going to be waving. There he is, over there. Brilliant. Um, afterwards, and we can give you registration details. So, uh, Professor Juan Cruz is uh, the Dean of Fine Arts at the Royal College of Art in London. And tonight he's going to talk about, in particular, um, projects that look at uh, connectivity and co production between the university and um, the city. In particular, um, Liverpool, but also potentially, if we have time, some um, germinal projects or initiatives that could be um, starting in London soon. So he was um, the director of the Liverpool School of Art and Design at Liverpool John Moores University. And he introduced there a really amazing suite of innovative uh, models of research and knowledge transfer with leading arts organisations, including Tate Liverpool, Liverpool Biennial, and FACT, the Foundation for Art and Creative technology? Yeah. Or critical. I always get creative. creative. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so please join me. I'm not going to go into massive biographical details um, because it's most important that we hear from Juan. So please join me in welcoming Juan to the podium. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, and thank you um, also to um, Mass University and College of Creative Arts. Uh, for inviting me halfway across the world to talk about this. I think it's a really um, timely uh, discussion to have. Yesterday when I was coming through the airport, uh, the people at customs were asking me what I was doing and I had to tell them it was a conference about the future of the art school and they sort of looked quite perplexed. Um, uh, and it is a world that's maybe quite difficult uh, to understand beyond, beyond, beyond its borders. But, uh, but I, think, I think for us who are involved with it, I think we are uh, undergoing a great deal of, of change, both in terms of the way in which we're funded and in terms of the kinds of things that we need to think about uh, theoretically, conceptually, practically. So I think these, these uh, opportunities to come together um, and talk about shared concerns are, are really essential and, 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 and too few, really. So, so thank you very much, um, Heather. Um, thank you also to Emma uh, for, for making things, things uh, possible here. And um, I know Claire's not able to be here, Claire Robinson, the, the Provost Chancellor, but I'd like to thank her. Um, as well um, as Simon, who looked after me so so well today. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to read. I, I could go on for uh, uh, days and be really a real bore about about art schools. So I seem to spend quite a lot of my time in them. But I've, I've prepared a um, script that I'll read, and I've got some some images to, to show you. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll get on with, with that if that's if that's okay. Um, so, um, I have spent most of my life in art school, so of course I have a vested interest in them as institutions. But anybody who's worked with me knows uh, that I've also always taken a highly critical stance to the way in which art schools operate and be significantly engaged in their change. This has been motivated by the belief that art schools have the potential to become uh, the most significant institutions in the ecology of art, in their potential to generate new knowledge, new experience and cultural transformation. There have been concerns expressed recently, certainly in the UK press, uh, regarding the changes that are deemed to have beset art schools. These concerns are echoed within art schools themselves and they involve such things as increasing bureaucratisation and accountability in respect of standards and student satisfaction, increases in student numbers and a much more competitive research and funding environment. Um, it's quite easy to paint a picture of art education as something we once did well 
but which is now imperiled and looks to deteriorate further as we try to introduce more change. This is certainly the kind of uh, mood sometimes that one feels in, in the UK. People, of course, have different reasons for going to art school. For some, historically, it's been their only access to education, and I realise that this is challenged now with the current funding situation. Um, others, I think art schools have played a significant role in democratising higher education. Um, others are drawn to art schools because of a technical facility they wish to develop. Some go there because they see it as an engaging place to be, a place for restless and inquiring minds to get together to shape the world in their own image. In fact, when people do come to art school explicitly wanting to be artists, we spend much time persuading them that what they think they might want to be is quite different to what they might need to be in order to have any relevance in the world. So we're not concerned with teaching people about a fixed category, but really about negotiating an understanding of the category or way of being that is ever in flux. I also want to say something about the art school as an institutional category. I can't claim to speak for all art schools. In my experience, there's a very broad range of art schools, all approaching their work in very different ways, and I dare say it was always like that. I think, I think it's, uh, it's quite tricky to be asked to kind of speak for a sector when, when one kind of knows the sector is operating in such different ways. Excuse me, it's, it's quite difficult to hear you. Is it? Okay. Is that to do with... Am I speaking too quickly, or is it it's not loud enough? Both. Both, okay. Fantastic. <laughs> is it better? Is that better? Let me actually get a bit closer. If I'm here, is that, is that better if I'm closer to the microphone? Yeah. Okay. So, um, the concerns expressed recently in the press have largely been about whether art schools today are still able to do the great things that they are perceived to have done in the past. And it may be true that they've been golden eras for art schools. But there may also be a great deal of myth-building in that. Even in those golden eras, whenever they may have been, it's only a handful of schools to which people refer. And even within those schools, there must be questions as to whether what happened there was by accident or design. Societal context, policy, leadership, inspirational teachers, dynamic students, all of these may have contributed to a perception of the golden age. And there seem to be today conflicting and contradictory concerns. Some are worried about craft and technique not being taught in a disciplined enough way, Some about the curriculum becoming too bureaucratic and restrictive, and therefore mitigating against a radical, free and permissive philosophy that once informed art school culture. There are also concerns that are really broader worries about contemporary life, culture and education. Concerns about fees, for example, or the way we live uh, in a culture of accountability where we feel human relations are being eroded by technology. But we can't pretend to live in other times, even if we might want to. Significant art practice today might be termed as post-conceptual. Fine art as a way of thinking through a practice that is developed through a range of media and means indistinguishable from those of a more general economic or mass communication process. Work, moreover, develops within a space for art that is increasingly global and fed by the circulation of artists, artworks, projects, festivals and events that develop sometimes tangential and often deep relationships to places. This calls on the art school to accept that it's no longer a small community sharing specialist skills, but an internationally connected node informed by relevant and quickly developing practice and theory. No longer a sheltered space, but one which can only really survive by opening itself to its sector and to the wider world. Art schools should help artists to be what they need to be today and in the future. That can mean many things, but general qualities might apply. Resourcefulness, flexibility, independence and discursiveness the capacity to negotiate and get things done. Art schools should certainly not be in the business of helping, artists be, uh, of helping students be artists for the past. Practically, it's impossible actively to support the many ways of working with which artists might want to engage. Artists can make work out of anything, and it's not important that they make these things themselves. But it would be foolish not to support significant engagement with the technologies that are shaping the way we live and with the platforms through which we are increasingly communicating and expressing ourselves. That's not to say that older technology doesn't have a place or a use, but it would seem unproductive for it to be at the centre of an artist's education. My own view is that it might not be so much about what we teach, or indeed how we teach, but about what kind of environment we can establish for students, and indeed artists and teachers, to find their own way through a complicated world that neither we nor they fully understand. There's a whole other conference maybe to be had around kind of models of, of, of pedagogy and fine art, which we're not, we don't really have time to go into today, but I think, I think the idea of, of, of art needing to be taught in the present 
and uh, through its kind of doing, um, as well as as well as a consideration of what happened before, is is, is key here. Okay. Um, I confess that with regard to art schools, I'm very much of a practitioner. I'm not such an effective researcher or theorist. I have an idea of how the places work, and I certainly understand something about how they feel and what it must be like to work and study there, which is very important to me. But the most useful, and perhaps the only things I can effectively speak about, uh, are to do with my own experiences of trying to work to fulfil the potential of the art school in different contexts. So I'd like first to speak about the example of Liverpool and the way in which we managed to forge models there of civic collaboration, employment and co-production through a range of projects and longer-term sustained initiatives. Um, and if there's time, um, as Heather said, I'll, I'll say a little bit about what, what um, I've been at the Royal College of Art now for a year and, and some of the things that we're starting to try to do, to do there. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with Liverpool. Um, so I arrived in Liverpool in 2008, attracted to a job at the School of Art and Design in Liverpool John Moores University um, that offered me professional advancement as well as the opportunity to work with developments that had been conspicuously absent at Goldsmiths where I'd been working before. Goldsmiths, which is a fantastic um, uh, school of fine art, um, and certainly the Department of Art, had a, a strong relationship with the art world in London and beyond, but was largely oblivious to the area in which it was located other than understanding it as a place where students were able to find cheap rents. Liverpool was different. As an art school that had started working hard to try to understand its context, contributing to civic enhancement and beginning to exploit its potential in the city. Much of this work had commenced in advance of Liverpool's tenure as European cultural capital in 2008. It was widely felt that while the city had, had since the development of Tate Liverpool, itself partly premised on the existence in Liverpool previously of the John Moore's Painting Prize, um, and subsequently the biennial, initiated by James Moores and Lewis Biggs, who have been the director of, um, of, of Tate Liverpool, as well as FACT, and the long-standing Blue Coat and Walker Art Gallery. Um, Liverpool had done a lot to develop its art institutions, um, but the art school had lagged behind and did not feel as if it was engaged in the developing scene there. Um, a report about the art school, written by the city's arts leaders, led to the university commissioning a review of the school, which came to be known as the EDGE Project. The review concluded that the art school needed to be more engaged with its constituencies in the city, and perhaps, more surprisingly, that it needed a new building to replace its existing, and in some cases, historic provision. Um, I arrived in 2008, just as the new Rick Mather building was being completed, and was faced with the task of supporting the move of the school from the many existing buildings, which is not easy and potentially disastrous for the school. So there was a sense, um, in, 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 on some levels, the, the innovation in the art school initially was premised on the idea of moving from a range of kind of historian, uh, uh, Victorian buildings um, uh, around the city into this kind of brand spanking new uh, shiny building, um, which was uh, eventually became effective, but actually in, in the moment of the move, uh, th th there, was a, there was a danger that, that, that moving, you know, the act of moving was seen to be the kind of change, uh, what, what would enable kind of change in the institution, when in fact it just simply meant people working in, in, in the first instance in quite inadequate conditions. Um, but anyway, again, a whole other conference on art school buildings, I think, could be, uh, could, could, could be held, but I won't go into too much detail about that. Um, but enough to say that it had pretty disastrous impacts in, in, on some level, but was very, very positive in the end. Okay. Um, alongside the EDGE project, which is specific to the School of Art and Design, a good deal of work had also been taking place, again geared primarily towards the European City of Culture in 2008, to bring together arts organisations in Liverpool and also to facilitate more contact between these organisations and the universities. My own decision to take up the post in Liverpool was significantly motivated by the fact that Christoph Grunenberg, the then director of Tate Liverpool, took part in my interview panel. Um, I suppose that as an artist working in academia, one always feels some sense of remorse about not being more actively connected with the real art world. And it seemed to me that the opportunity for Liverpool, it seemed to me that the opportunity that I had in Liverpool was one through which it might be possible to bring closer the worlds of academia and art in a very tangible sense. Um, I think it was also important for me and those who followed me to Liverpool to try to make our own lives as interesting as they could be, as well as championing the, re the very real benefits we felt that art could bring to a city in such desperate need of cultural and economic development as Liverpool was and, and indeed still is. My colleague at the time, Michael Parkinson, not the chat show host, but um, <laughs> a, a revered uh, uh, expert on, on urban issues, um, who is the director of the uh, university's, Liverpool John Moores University European Institute for Urban Affairs, pointed out very eloquently at the time that while it might be, and almost certainly was, jobs and economics that brought people to cities, 
It was culture that kept them there. The sense of a city's capacity to reflect on itself and demonstrate collective regard for the experiences of, the experiences of its citizens. This to me seemed like a beautiful idea and one that made a lot of sense leading to my lobbying at the university to demonstrate a significant generosity of spirit towards the partnership with the arts organisations that might make the city better. It was quite easy to realise in Liverpool that the strength and indeed even the viability of our institutions, be they museums, galleries or universities or even hospitals, um, that the viability of our institutions was intimately bound up with the success of the city itself. Um, there was and still is a huge imperative to attract people to the city and once there, to encourage them to remain there. And so it was not so difficult to make the argument for the university to invest in its relationships with the cultural sector, and also in its partnerships with specific organisations. The economic circumstances of the time in the UK, um, and I mean, perhaps globally, uh, were also propitious to such moves. The recession from 2008 onwards, together with the subsequent change in government, saw public spending in the arts and other public services diminish considerably. There were real concerns about how these cuts would impact on cities such as Liverpool, which had both a disproportionate reliance on public sector employment through its universities, hospitals, etc., um, as well as, because of its kind of economic situation, as well as having significant need for the social, youth, cultural and educational services that were very um, evidently being lined up for cuts in succeeding years. Um, so there was serious concern about what was going to happen to a city that had developed quite significantly towards 2008. Meanwhile, uh, the Brown report into funding for higher education, and incidentally, interestingly, I think Lord Brown, uh, who undertook that report for the Labour government, um, was also and still remains the chair of the Tate Board of, Trust, of, the Board of Trustees for, for the Tate. Um, so the Brown report published proposals that would lead to universities being able to raise their fees to £9,000. Uh, um, uh, 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 sorry. To, to raise their fees to £9,000, supported by a government loan book. So in a sense, it was the beginning, I suppose it's heralded, the, the, the kind of partial privatisation of, of higher education in the UK. Um, this meant that many universities found themselves in significantly, significantly better off as long as they recruited the requisite students. Um, but that they were also challenged to deliver much enhanced value for money by students who were now paying directly for their education. In this much more competitive and potentially lucrative market, it became essential for the university, certainly in Liverpool, to reinvest back into the city with which its success was so intimately bound. Um, I'm, 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 I'm steering clear here of, of, of saying anything about uh, feelings or thoughts I may have about government financial policy in relation to education, I'm talking a little bit more around what, uh, what we kind of tried to do with the circumstances that we found ourselves in at, at, at the coalface. So, in a sense, I, I'm just pleased to take my acquiescence for. Uh, to suggest that I kind of agree with this, the, these, uh, these shifts, it's simply you know, what was there. Um, but it wasn't really until the arrival of Nigel Wetherill as VC, the Vice-Chancellor of the University, local John Moores University, in, in, in 2011, that the approach that, 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 we'd been mit that we'd been advocating really began to take hold um, as a strategy. Uh, and I think, interestingly, this demonstrates uh, the value of the enlightened leadership from the top in our large and ostensibly collegially governed uh, institutions. What we've managed to do in advance of Nigel Weatherall's arrival was to establish the ideas, friendships, that were so crucial to achieving more formal partnerships. Uh, we worked on many initiatives in this respect, uh, around the visual arts, as well as in music and theatre through partnerships with the Philharmonic, uh, the Everyman Theatre. Uh, we also worked significantly with the John Moore's Painting Prize. We established a, a, a partnership with, with, with Tate. Uh, through PhD students, etc. So we had a number of partnerships with a, with a number of organisations in, in, in the city that were, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how they were formalised. Um, at the base of all these initiatives was a financial contribution from the university to the organisation, but in most instances the university received far more back in terms of research funding, recruitment and reputation. From the perspective of the art school, we raised our gain considerably and gained contact with international players in our field. Um, interestingly, though, the Vice-Chancellor's ambition was to use the arts also to instil confidence in each and every one of his students. He realised that they may not leave the university knowing much about, say, Stockhausen or Mondrian, um, but he did want every student confidently to be able to walk into a concert hall or museum anywhere in the world. So from the university's perspective, and I think this is quite important, this engagement with the arts wasn't just about politics or brand recognition but about a very real effort to enhance and make more particular the experience of every student from whatever background and whatever subject they were studying. 
It's hard to say the extent to which um, it would have been due to these cultural initiatives, as there were many others that took place alongside them, but the standing and reputation of the university, as well as the School of Art and Design, grew considerably over these years. Uh, when I arrived at the university, uh, it was stumbling really along the bottom of the UK university league tables, whereas the latest Guardian table shows it steadily above mid-table at 58. Uh, interestingly now, one place above the University of Liverpool, which is this great kind of city rival. Um, and is now, in fact, the best university in Merseyside, which is not so significant, but also fourth university in the Northwest. Um, and the latest REF, the Research Excellence Framework, which is the, um, the, the system that we use in the UK to measure the quality and value of institutional research, uh, the, the university now receives 5.3 million annual quality research funding from the Higher Education Funding Council for England, uh, which is a huge 54% increase from its previous 2008 settlement, and one that certainly hasn't been mirrored across, across the sector. The university has also significantly stabilised its national student survey results with many programmes in the School of Art and Design now steadily achieving 80 to 90% plus uh, scores. I think it's uncont uncontestable that these enhancements, as well as being facilitated by better management and data handling, as these things often are, um, have also been due significantly to the university finding ways of attracting world-leading academic talent to Liverpool by generating productive collaboration with institutions in the city and beyond to make these talented individuals, to make these talented individuals believe that this really was a place where they could develop their careers in an engaged and connected context. The sense of passion and drive that this has engendered in the staff and students of the university has also been deeply significant in enhancing its overall performance. Um, and I'd also say that such things as home and uh, international recruitment have also been significantly improved by the university's work around the arts, but also around other areas of uh, engaging with uh, kind of, uh, other civic institutions. One, one of the key ideas to which the Vice-Chancellor agreed enthusiastically was the funding of permanent posts to work between the art school and partner institutions. In the first instance, we had three posts funded on a recurrent basis, centrally by the university, with Take Liverpool, Liverpool Biennial and FACT. The idea was that the post holders would work across institutions, spending half their time undertaking teaching and research at the university, and the other half engaged in relevant activities of partner arts organisations. We were keen to go beyond what can often feel like a tokenistic collaboration between sectors and achieve meaningful, embedded and productive exchange. We wanted to make sure that these exchanges and collaboration would be institutionally embedded and not only personally driven. We had a hunch also that by enabling work across the curatorial and the academic, we would attract more remarkable people to work in the city, which we, we certainly did. I think at the heart of this was an idea that we kept on, we kept on meeting, or kept on coming across people uh, who didn't quite want to spend all their time in the museum, didn't quite want to spend all their time in, in the art school, and it seemed that trying to provide a, you know, a, a bit of both in the job seemed ideal. It, was, it, was, it seemed a kind of great form of employment. Not, not with that kind of issues, but, but, but important. Uh, we had previously in the university funded collaborative PhDs in a similar vein which had also been productive. Uh, one of these students' theses, for example, became a headline paying show at Tate uh, Liverpool called Art Turning Left. Uh, so the PhD thesis was, was effectively a, a public exhibition at a you know, pretty prestigious place. Uh, but PhDs, of course, are time-limited and project-based and did not facilitate the kind of long-term exchange and engagement that we wanted to facilitate. Um, the posts were not uncomplicated to devise or implement, as many issues surfaced around uh, the difficulties of people working across more than one institution, but we did get them through and contracted some extraordinary people who would probably never have come to the city without such an opportunity. Um, it's also important to say that these posts were graded at lecturer level to make it absolutely clear that this was not an exclusively research-focused kind of professorial sinecure appointment. It was really about people coming to do uh, real work curatorially and academically in, in the city. We were very clear at the recruitment uh, interviews that we wanted the post holders somehow to embody the collaborative model that we'd, that we'd established uh, and to exploit the opportunities that, we, that we, we'd, we'd established through our joint work across the city. The arts organisations with whom we were working were of course delighted as it gave them just the research uh, capacity that they had either never had or would have been forced to diminish given the stringent funding cuts that were and had been taking place. Also, uh, what it provided the arts organisations was access to the university's broader research and technical capacity. Um, so it was a very significant and real form of, 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 of what we kind of call knowledge exchange, I suppose. Um, 
the Arts Council noticed what we were doing. The Arts Council is the major funder of, uh, of, of some of these organisations with whom we were working, noticed our work, feeling, I think, that it may have, through this model, uh, be able to identify a new way of supporting funding for museums and galleries more broadly. Uh, and we established a group with the Arts Council, loosely led by us and a couple of other like-minded institutions. Um, uh, Northumberland was significant, as was Northumberland in their relationship with the Baltic. Um, to discuss models of engagement between higher education institutions and the cultural sector, and indeed to help the cultural sector understand how to work with universities. We found that one of the significant uh, barriers to um, uh, galleries, museums, etc., working with universities is that, it's, is that it's quite hard to find the front door to a university. You know, you can do, who do you talk to? There's so many different people, so many different... So partly we're dealing with those kind of issues as well. Um, in order, perhaps, to reward... Uh, uh, the specific activity that we'd uh, undertaken and perhaps also to encourage others, the Arts Council supported a funding bid we made called Artist City, uh, which is designed to support five initiatives uh, in relation to this work. Uh, significantly, the Arts Council accepted our investment, the investment that we made in the, in the cross-institutional post, uh, as match funding towards their own investment in these, in these projects with the joint uh, post becoming one of the five strands of the, of the project. This was very important for us in the School of Art and Design in relation also to the university, because it meant that we were able to demonstrate uh, in the, 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 these schemes in which the university had very generously and significantly invested uh, to start with, were then drawing additional funding, and actually were, were, were helping the university to, to generate a, a kind of cost-positive model around these projects. So it was, it was a very, very helpful and important negotiation with the Arts Council to make, to make this happen. Um, I'll, I'll, so I'll go through the project Artist City. So we describe the project as, as, as follows. Artist City, a collaboration between Liverpool Art and Design, arts organisations and studio groups across Liverpool, will facilitate critical engagement and talent development through five strands designed to develop art teachers, critical writers, emerging artists through showcasing the artistic excellence of the region. Liverpool School of Art and Design is increasingly recognised for its innovation in driving up the standards of training for artists and designers. It is now looking at how to simultaneously focus its energies and resources to support emerging and mid-career artists in the city, strengthening its cultural partnerships to work together to address acknowledged gaps in provision. Um, interestingly, the Arts Council can't fund universities, it can't fund teaching and learning, it can fund... So part of what we had to do in order to uh, achieve this funding was demonstrate that as a university, of course, we were teaching students, but we were also going beyond that remit to support uh, artists in the city. <coughs> artist City looks to address Arts Council Goal 1, talent and artistic excellence and are thriving and celebrated, strengthening Liverpool's offer as a centre for excellence in exhibition by focusing on an underdeveloped part of the ecology, growing and supporting talent. Broadly, Artist City aims to provide quality support for artists to develop their practice, in doing so, the programme is all about developing artists' expertise to ensure that their practice can engage with people in the city and beyond. Um, sorry, so the proposal. Artist City is about ensuring that emerging artists outside statutory education develop their understanding and skills to engage meaningfully with the public. It's about talent development and bringing internationally significant artists to live and work in Liverpool. It looks to a longer-term legacy which will reverse the talent drain to London. That was an important kind of aspect of, of the work we were trying to, to do. Um, yeah. Um, no, no, no. Okay, that's enough on that. Um, so the programme had five interlinked strengths. So the Artist Teacher Summer School is designed to reinvigorate teachers' own creative practice and in so doing support them to enthuse emerging school um, and further education aid artists. So this is work that we were undertaking. What we noticed in Liverpool was that... Um, one of the problems that we had was that many of the students who were coming through to the college were, were, were prepared in ways that, that um, were not necessarily helpful to the development when they, they got there. Um, and so we want, we, we, and, and at the same time, neither did we want to, 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 to suggest that we knew the way in which people should be prepared to come to art school. What we were trying to think about was how can we find a, some, some more common ground with the way in which kind of teachers are dealing with, with, with students of a younger age. So the Artist Teacher Summer School put together um, leading um, artists uh, together with uh, people working in secondary schools for uh, two week long workshops over the summer. So there were about 20 uh, school teachers with four or five artists, and, and really it was about a kind of model of, of co production. It wasn't telling them what they should do, it had some interesting results. Um, Hunting in Packs was a program of support for artists in the first stage of the developing their careers, including studio mentoring and real world contextual support via symposia, etc. So we worked with 
um, Urban Splash, a large development company, who let us have space in the city where we set up studios for 20 graduating artists every, every year, uh, together with mentoring and symposia around professional development that brought people uh, from around the world to talk to them. Um, the Exhibition Research Centre, I'll talk about later, is a transdisciplinary research and learning centre that will organise and host events, exhibitions and publications in support of the development of public exhibition culture in Liverpool. And I'll talk in, in more length about that a bit later. Thinking, writing and engaging uh, was uh, about developing ideas and engagement with visual art through writing, develop, cri developing critical writing and strengthening the quality of exhibition reviews and blogs about artists' work and making this accessible to the public in order to deepen engagement with art in Liverpool. Uh, and we worked with uh, a local uh, website called Art in Liverpool, uh, called, what's it called? I can't remember what it was called, I think. Um, but so, so we worked with kind of people who were trying to kind of publish critical writing in Liverpool to establish opportunities to pay writers uh, and to deliver, and, and also for writers who are writing about art to receive mentorship in respect of their, of their writing. Um, and then International Voices. Uh, was attracting artists, curators, writers to live and work in Liverpool. International Voices was effectively our collaborative posts. Um, so the amount of money that we put into our salaries was accepted as match funding by the Arts Council for this broader overall uh, project. Um, in 2014, uh, so this is just last year, it feels like it's ages ago, but it's just last year really. In 2014 we staged a one-day conference in collaboration with the Arts Council at the University um, at LJMU uh, called the Cultural Knowledge Ecology, University Arts and Cultural Partnerships. And the conference aimed uh, to do the two things that it says there, encourage a shared understanding of the principles of engagement for best practice and promote knowledge exchange with a focus on the maturing of partnerships, jointly identify future developments and opportunities. So in a way it was, it was a conference that was about talking about the benefits of these joint partnerships but also in, uh, trying to provide a kind of, a kind of toolkit. Uh, the morning session presented discussion documents uh, including the cultural uh, knowledge ecology a report that we, uh, we authored together with Sarah Fisher at the Arts Council to outline models of best practice for these sorts of engagement. Um, and the Arts Council refreshed 10-year strategy. Um, the conference, so the, 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 the discussions were presented by the Arts Council, England, Universities UK and a range of vice chancellors uh, through panel discussions. Uh, and the afternoon sessions offered opportunities to participate um, in, uh, in, in discussions around collaborative approaches to placemaking and civic responsibility, cultural partnerships, cultural value, and the research excellence framework. Um, so all those things. Um, so really, with, with, within, 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 quite, within not very many years, we came to be uh, regarded by the Arts Council of Universities UK um, as uh, you know, quite, a, quite a significant driver of, of uh, approaches towards um, developing partnership within, within universities. So from a university perspective, this became quite, quite significant in the sense that we were able to place our Vice-Chancellor uh, on panels uh, and, and at the head of debates around, around this developing area of activity. Um, more, more locally, uh, this collaborative activity led to the school being taken much more seriously on an international stage, uh, which paving the way for our inclusion in 2013 in the uses of art, a project undertaken in partnership with uh, L'Anta Nationale, uh, which, is, which is a European museum conf confederation of, of the highest order. Um, so the contacts with some of the leading people engaged in this project uh, predated my arrival, uh, but the establishment of more, the establishment of more formal links uh, and our inclusion in this project, a 2.5 million uh, euro, five-year European project, uh, would not even have been considered possible without our capacity to have demonstrated our engagement in broader kind of um, uh, a broader cultural agenda. And so the International um, and the Uses of Art was a project. So it was us. I was very proud of this map because it put us in uh, there in, in Liverpool with only the BNA and, and Grisdale, and then linked us to the Reine Sophia in Madrid, Macbo in Barcelona. Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven, Salt in Istanbul, all these kind of other institutions. And it was really in 2013 uh, something of a testament to where we'd arrived through the work that we were doing locally that really granted us some very significant uh, kind of international recognition. The Exhibition Research Centre. So perhaps the most notable and certainly for me the most rewarding of the projects facilitated by the Joint Posts and the Arts Council funding was the Exhibition Research Centre which served both as a public interface for the university, a training ground for students, and a means of generating and organising research and further collaboration. 
The Exhibition Research Centre was established following Anthony Hudeck's appointment to Liverpool John Moores University to one of the joint posts I described, uh, this to the one held jointly between us and Take Liverpool. That's not Anthony Hudeck, by the way, he's much younger. And <laughs> I think I'm more handsome, he's pretty handsome as well, but anyway. Um, soon after Hudeck came into post, he outlined plans for a research centre that would be housed in the School of Art and Design Gallery. This had been part of the development, the gallery that is, of the new building. Up to that point, the gallery, which in the original scheme was designated a commercial space, had been used flexibly, sometimes for internal purposes, to stage shows of student work or as a project space, and at others to house touring exhibitions such as Michelle Cotton's Design Research Centre, uh, and the Yes Men, curated by Astro Superac at Carnegie Mellon, or to take part in other citywide arts festivals and initiatives such as Look or the Arabic Arts Festival. Something of a tradition around collaborative exhibition making had established itself in the School of Art and Design through the work that John Byrne had undertaken with the Liverpool Biennial on the Site Gallery, a large space near Tate Liverpool on the Albert Dock. This work was facilitated by my predecessor in Liverpool, Martin Downey, and was part of the effort through the EDGE project that I mentioned before to establish a more vibrant, relevant and engaged art school to contribute towards Liverpool's hosting of the European Capital of Culture. Um, there had also always been intermittent exhibitions at the Hope Street Gallery, where the school was previously located, I showed that in one of the old Victorian buildings, uh, the most notable of which was probably a rendition of the Martha Rosler Library, which was installed there in 2008 as part of that year's Liverpool Biennial. So there had been kind of sporadic activity uh, around exhibition making, I, I would say. Um, by the time uh, Hudeck arrived in 2012, we'd grown rather tired of the rather haphazard arrangements for programming the gallery in the new building. Uh, the Art and Design Academy, which was later to be named with the blessing of the Okono, the John Lennon Art and Design Building. And we'd started to consider different options that might begin to make better sense of the platform that the gallery afforded. One of these ideas was to house a research centre in the gallery with the purpose of making visible the research that took place in the school. The idea was somehow to display the discussion, study, interaction and artefacts associated with the development of research in art and design, and perhaps also other areas of the university. I spoke, for example, to the Department of Engineering about showing the high-powered imaging machines for which they were earning such high plaudits, the Astrophysics Research Centre about their world-leading telescope engineering lab, and sports science about getting footballers to run on a treadmill, um, as many footballers habitually did to have their fitness levels monitored. But there was very little response to my solicitations across the university, and I should say also a reluctance, even within the school, to engage with the visualisation of research I was outlining. Um, and I think hardly surprising, perhaps, given the fact that you know, the kind of exhibition work in universities is really, is really funded, so it needs people who have a passion for it, really, for it to, to, to take place. When Hudek was appointed, I, I had a sense and a hope that he might engage with the programming of the gallery, and to this end, uh, and because of his stated wish to bring together the practical, administrative and curatorial aspect of ex exhibition making, I designated his office as a kind of large workshop storeroom that had developed beside the gallery, uh, which was a great space that seemed to embody many of uh, Anthony Hudeck's concerns around thinking the exhibition as an involved and engaged process in the round. Um, so soon after Hudeck came into post, he developed the concept of the Exhibition Research Centre as an entity that would, through making and staging exhibitions, develop knowledge surrounding their history, form, techniques and purpose. We would have a programme of exhibitions and associated lectures concerning the very nature of exhibitions themselves. This struck me as a brilliant idea. I've been involved, as, as many people I'm sure have, in numerous discussions to try and determine research themes uh, in institutions, particularly in art schools, that were specific enough to give the impression that there was joint thinking going on, and loose enough to accept the most academics, and certainly academics in art and design, um, are really just doing their own thing. Uh, the Exhibition Research Centre seemed perfect, uh, precise and focused on one level, around the subject of the exhibition, but with a sense that the exhibition was a relevant entity for people working across art and design, whatever one does in these fields, uh, it seems inevitable that one will encounter a moment that requires a level of self-display that we might define as the exhibition. My sense at the time was that we could was that we would be celebrating this shared preoccupation with, or at least certainly reliance, upon the exhibition. It seemed timely, too, with exhibition studies becoming a subject of increasing interest uh, to scholars and professionals. There were some significant parameters that we quickly deemed essential to the functioning of the gallery in this capacity. That the programming should be consistent and purposeful, i.e. that the gallery would cease to be used to stage other citywide shows and student work that would be programmed uh, exclusively and specifically to support its specific research agendas and that some dedicated funding would be facilitated. 
uh, partly because of budget constraints, but also through a sense that the gallery might bring together various aspects of the schools. We tried implicitly through the programme and explicitly through workload allocation to involve numerous individuals from the academic and technical staff of the school, the motivating factor being that they would engage with practice at a level to which they might be unaccustomed and become exposed to significant material with which they would be unfamiliar, in a sense rewarding uh, the curious. This was especially important as it was clear that some viewed with jealousy and suspicion the deployment of the gallery to serve as the base for a new research centre and its concomitant withdrawal from the pool of spaces available to staff and students. And I think it's only a partial accident that the opening of the ERC, the Exhibition Research Centre, coincided with a significant restructure of the school's technical services provision and staffing in order to ensure that technical resources were enhanced and made more ready, readily available to students and researchers. Um, and the new technical staff team did in fact play a significant and growing role in the Exhibition Research Centre, ultimately being some of the main participants and contributors to the work that was achieved there. Our argument, of course, was that only by engaging seriously and with evident commitment to the Research Centre could we hope ever to get anything out of it. This argument was helped by the external funding that we were able to raise or via towards the Exhibition Programme and publications, so that at least in cash terms it remained cost-neutral and by the way in which the programme evidenced significant quality and achieved important collaborations for us with additional external organisations such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the ICA in London, uh, Veals, etc. Some of the funding we were awarded was piecemeal and tied to specific exhibitions, uh, uh, the, the Iowa Foundation, um, uh, where else did we get? the Alfina Trust, there were various kind of you know, small amounts of funding that we got. Uh, other exhibitions came with their own, their own funding stream, but the most significant and relevant funding uh, was on the basis of the um, Artist City application that I just, I just referred to before, um, and which tied the activity and programme costs of the Exhibition Research Centre to a larger project around professional development for artists in Liverpool. Um, the Exhibition Research Centre, we argued, provided models of exhibition making that would be unavailable to artists in a city whose cultural economy as well as its greater economy, in fact, was dominated by the public sector and the kind of pressures brought about through the returns required of large publicly funded organisations. It seemed that we could offer a smaller and more nimble model of activity that might also feel somewhat closer to students as well as emerging and persistent artists in the city. Um, it, it, in a place in Liverpool where, where, where with such a kind of, you know, with a large amount of kind of galleries and museums, it, it, it's tricky because um, I mean, there's a wonderful provision but at the same time, that provision is, is, is because it's publicly funded, is always designated towards achieving certain, certain goals. And we always felt that there was a certain kind of more experimental model of activity that maybe some of our students and artists in the city were missing. What always seemed tricky in Liverpool was to understand how it was that the city might develop and fulfil the artistic and cultural promise that it was generally understood to have. There was often a tussle between what felt imported into the situation and the clamours of the local and authentic character of the city that it seemed impossible to reconcile. People coming into the city lamented the, what people often call the Glasgow thing, referring to Glasgow's uh, kind of artistic renaissance some ten years previously, lamented that the Glasgow thing wasn't happening. And while this would clearly not have been the model to pursue, it seemed obvious that a few small schemes might help to get some discussion going. Um, alongside funding for the ERC programme, as I mentioned, the Arts Council grant enabled us also to operate a graduate studio scheme, mentoring for graduate students, critical writing workshops, um, uh, etc. Um, and all, all, yeah. um, so the first exhibition we staged under the auspices of the Exhibition Research, Research Centre was uh, Jacques Charlier's uh, Photographs of Openings, which introduced historical, archival and theoretical concerns around the exhibition and its familiar tracking <coughs> of the opening. I'll come back to this, but I think it relevant to mention that Charlier's series of photographs, as well as serving as a significant document of the period, are an artwork in themselves. At the Exhibition Research Centre we showed all the work sequentially, so that the last images are of an exhibition opening where Jacques Charlier showed the photographs of openings that he'd taken throughout the two years where he was making them, um, alongside the work of Onkawara, and then of course photographed that opening. Hudek's observation was that at that point Charlier was faced with a decision about what to do with his work, to carry on with it and adopt a kind of perpetual temporality of someone like Onkawara, consistently repeating the same gesture, or to stop and move on. Um, in a video shot by our digital imaging technician at the School of Art and Design, Andy Freeney, Charlie is depicted prancing around impishly at the opening and engaging in conversation with a varied audience at the opening. Of course, the video feels like a, an extension of the work itself, a video of an opening of an exhibition of photographs of an opening. 
and the conceit is not lost on Charlier, who, in a voiceover, reflects on the 40-year gap between the making of the work and the current exhibition. And I'll just play some of that video now. We are in Liverpool in the Art and Design Academy, the Confit Street. We open a new space, the exhibition research. I show a lot of photography of the 70s in the art world. Ah, come and see the <laughs> introduction of the exhibition. It was in that time, in 75, an exhibition and you can see on the wall here all the photography during one year of the art world. And today, 35 years after, we do the same thing. <laughs> Um, I'm always taken by that, that what, what Jacques Charlier says there, where he says now, 25, 25 years later, 35 years later, we do the same, we do the same thing. I think, kind of comically, but I think interestingly and poignantly, referring to what can often feel as a kind of inertia uh, in the art world and a kind of resistance towards, uh, or maybe not resistance towards change, but a kind of comfort in, in, in familiarity. Um, the ERC programme was quite varied, quite intense, uh, and I think significant, and merits mentioned here, and I'd like to show you a few things about it, partly because it was also seen by, by so few people when it, when it did happen. Um, so Charlie's exhibitions of, of openings was followed by an exhibition by C.S. Lee, uh, a London-based curator, writer and filmmaker, C.S. Lee, focusing on rarely seen aspects of uh, an exceptional career, uh, which kind of tied together curatorial work, uh, photography, exhibition making, writing, and partly the challenge of the exhibition was how to bring these kind of disparate elements together in an exhibition form. Um, uh, Blackout was, yeah, and, and then and that that led to a, to a kind of performance of C.S. Lee that took place in, in in Tate Modern. So right from the start, we were kind of forging and contributing to quite a significant debate around uh, around exhibition making. Then we had an exhibition called Blackout, which was kind of more conventional kind of group show around uh, photographic-based practices, um, and followed by an article called Peggy Booth uh, with an exhibition called Design Representation, um, uh, which was a, a show based on three years of extensive research that she'd undertaken on the collections of the Royal Museum for Central Africa in Tervuren uh, in Brussels. Uh, so in a sense, quite often we were trying to think about artists who were making work kind of about display and about exhibition. Uh, that was followed by a show called ABC in Sound, uh, where we looked at the work of uh, uh, Bob Cobbing. Uh, and again, we're kind of interested in, in, in the figure of Cobbing as an artist, but we're also interested in trying to think about the exhibition strategies that we might deploy towards facilitating a show of this very kind of multifaceted artist. So one of the things that we that we did in, in this exhibition as well as others was to borrow uh, an exhibition mechanism that he'd undertaken in, 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 in Holland in the, in the 70s. So in a sense we were kind of making, revisiting, trying to contribute to some kind of debate around what exhibitions were and how they could be, how they could be structured. Um, with um, Hisashika Takahashi, this was an exhibition um, that was a kind of reconstruction uh, of an exhibition that had taken uh, place in the, in, in the wide, wide space in 1967. Um, Takahashi had been Eve Klein uh, and then um, Rauschenberg's assistant mm. uh, and described himself as a kind of lazy artist. But one of the things he did was to make these um, uh, kind of paintings that, 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 that shone in, um, in kind of blue light. Um, and then we did an exhibition called Please Come to the Show. <clears throat> we worked here with David Senior from the Museum of Modern Art in New York, 
uh, to make an exhibition of exhibition uh, kind of uh, exhibition invitations, so exhibition paraphernalia, uh, really to talk about exhibition culture over the last 40 years. That's David Senior with John Webster, our senior technician, who devised the, the, the display mechanism for the, for the show. I suppose the reason I'm kind of interested in talking about this on, on a kind of local level is that as well as, as, well as serving some <clears throat> kind of grander, kind of civic and national agendas, the work that we started doing was also very uh, kind of uh, useful in terms of developing the more local art school culture. You know, the idea of working with academics, technicians across the board to generate work that everybody understood was operating on a kind of world-class level uh, was, was just extremely kind of uh, useful in terms of team building and, 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 and place making at the art school. Um, so that's more. Please come to the show. And then Adrian Henry. We were also concerned through the exhibition. Adrian Henry was a, a Liverpool-based uh, uh, poet and uh, artist. And we were also tr kind of keen to try to make sense of the local, the local scene through the exhibitions that we, that we undertook there. Um, as well as the exhibition programme, we also had some quite significant keynote lectures. We, we, we had a series of lectures around the concept of, uh, which is called the, um, um, what's it called? The Kunsthaler effect. So in a sense, we were trying to look at the, the Kunsthaler as a non-collecting art institution that developed um, in, in, in Europe through, through the 60s and invited Maria Lynn to talk about experiences that tends to Kunsthaler. Um, uh, Alana Heiss speaking about establishing uh, PS1 in New York and then the merger with the Museum of Modern Art. Mishka Mirken talking about uh, a really interesting exhibition that, that, that he'd done about different forms of kind of heritage. Um, Adeline von Fürstenberg uh, talking about kind of significant international initiatives. And Jürgen Harten, director of Kunsthalle uh, Dusseldorf in the 70s, talking about the kind of politics of, of, of developing a certain kind of form of art and exhibition making in a, at a key moment in history. Um, I think it's only really in, in retrospect that I've come to understand something more significant about the Exhibition Research Centre, and that is that far from being a space to celebrate and propagate new models of the exhibition form, um, it, it, it was, I would propose, a space determined to contribute to challenging of the exhibition um, as a ubiquitous model for the repeated display and revelation of art. The real and symbolic gesture of withdrawing the exhibition space from the regular economy of spaces used by researchers and students, and the collaborative work that the programme engendered between academics, technicians, students, library and reception workers, who was displaying not their own work, but an alternative proposition, was most effective in generating community and small-scale significant engagements. This was the real impact of the centre, that it changed the way in which we worked and related to each other across our roles in the institution. The last exhibition that was programmed by Hudek for the Exhibition Research Centre during my time in Liverpool was a survey of works by Adrian Henry. The exhibition was titled Total Art, after the name of the landmark Thames and Hudson book Henry published in 1974, Total Art, Environments and Happenings. To some extent, the exhibition was an attempt to recover Henry from his reputation as a rather avuncular popular painter and poet, and to suggest that the work he was doing was in fact more interesting for its reluctance to settle into a given form. Far from attempting to be an archival survey, and much like the exhibition of Bob Cobbing that I showed earlier, the exhibition sought to demonstrate and show the range of alternative approaches that Henry had entertained and deployed in his practice. It's quite difficult in Liverpool, a city riddled with sentiment regarding the ghosts of its past, to find ways of re-engaging with a vernacular history that doesn't become mired in appearing to be a claim for a kind of sentimental exceptionism. At the same time, without some sense of the particularity of a place, there's a danger that culture tends towards a kind of sanitised feed of ubiquitous global art mobilisations and gestures. The interesting thing about Henry, as a figure who also is somehow seen to embody or at least have been hugely prominent during a time when it's perceived that Liverpool was last regarded to be a significant cultural player, is that he somehow eschewed the mechanisms that would have enabled him to become a more significant figure in the art world. His work is poorly known and barely has a market value. The Exhibition Research Centre show is the most significant survey of his work there's been, so no exhibitions in major museums and few works in national collections. He is, in short, and certainly on the surface, hardly the kind of artist to be used as a model for the ambitions around professional development of artists and institutions in Liverpool. Yet, what's important to my mind about Henry, again like Cobbing, is that he points towards a practice that is not punctuated by large, orchestrated public manifestations. 
but which is animated through a series of often concurrent events where any sense of separation between the private and the public disappears, and the artist enacts their practice always and inevitably in relation to an immediate community of participants. Henry's example is also perhaps useful in pushing back at the idea around the desirability of a version of the Glasgow model taking hold in Liverpool, or indeed any other cities anxious about the visibility of their own cultural muscle. As a research project, the Exhibition Research Centre explored a number of areas around highly specialist questions to do with exhibition cultures, archiving of exhibitions, and the form of the exhibition. Perhaps, and to my mind more significantly, the centre also addressed questions about how to develop, or perhaps recognise, what potentially existed for an authentic development of artists in the city without aping the potentially outworn models employed by other places. Pedagogically, too, the Exhibition Research Centre pointed towards ways forward in the development of new models of fine art teaching, where a conception of publicness might accompany the work throughout its development. If we can move effectively from a conception of the studio as a private space, where work is thought about and made, and that of the gallery as the place where it first encounters the world, to an understanding that any artwork is probably public even in, in advance of its inception, and continues to be made long after it enters a collection or is destroyed, and that the spaces around the artwork therefore become unstable, we might be able to make some headway. I find myself coming back to the video of Jacques Charlier saying, uh, and they still do the same thing, a statement full of a sort of incredulity about the way in which we perpetuate norms of engagement. There's an awful sense here of the artwork operating in a kind of bad faith on a number of fronts by continuing to work in ways which we all uh, seem on some level also to understand as tired and really in need of revitalising. In education too, uh, so many of my colleagues seem worn down by having to do things in ways they believe to be ineffectual and somehow the least bad option, without really finding alternatives. Of course there are political, administrative and institutional concerns always in the way of change. We can't simply stop, redesign and start again. Our institutions are juggernauts that run with their own significant momentum. Their trajectory can't be stopped or altered at speed, but it can significantly be trimmed uh, and readjusted in order to attempt an internal shift of momentum, which I think is very, very important. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Royal College, so I think we're running out of time, um, but I just did want to finish by saying something... Um, what did I finish last saying? Could you go another, another 10 one, if, you're, if that would help? Well, it's, a, it's okay. I, th I think if, if, if it seems relevant, but I, I, just, um, I just had a concluding paragraph that may, maybe I can, I can say in relation to this. Um, I, think, I think the important thing for any institution, and I think part of what we're trying to do in the Exhibition Research Centre was, was, was that, and, and, and it's part of kind of our research responsibility, I think the ambition should be for institutions to be involved as much in creating knowledge as on, on dwelling on it. Um, what did I say? Sorry, that was first. Okay, I suppose what I'm, what I'm um, uh, trying to get at, both in terms of, of the idea of local specificity and kind of approaches towards different um, approaches towards making <coughs> making the most of circumstances, um, um, is, is, is a question about how we can work. Uh, question about how those of us who work and lead art schools. How can we feel that what we do um, uh, is, is is enriching and not simply a means of achieving something else? Um, how can we work towards translating, and I use the word translating advisedly, the unavoidable realities that we inherit and have to work with in our institutions, so that our colleagues and students can work towards something meaningful, meaningful, rewarding and transformative that deploys what we've always loved about art schools without blindly and nostalgically holding on to tired models and worn out certainties and assumptions. Thank you very much. any inquiries or um, ask Juan to unpack any of the aspects that he's introduced us to this evening. I might want to I might put this video on without sound so we can have Okay, it's, it's a great video. Session, so, and, and just to contextualise, this is a recent um, graduation project from the RCA? This is someone who just graduated this year, but, yeah. I, but I just felt that the, when I saw it, well, I showed it on any occasion I can, but I think it's great. But I also think <laughs> the spirit of it is, is, is close to what I was trying to say. But I remember the sound. The sound is kind of a very windy kind of sound. Which I think we understand. <laughs> yeah, it's kind, of, okay. it's kind of quite specific to the weather here. <laughs> um, I've got a, I've got a, start, a starter for ten question, which um, you, you spoke um, 
uh, very interestingly about the Exhibition Research Centre and the Anthony Hudick role. How about um, the, the roles with um, FACT and uh, the Liverpool Biennial, those, those um, uh, kind of collaborative posts? How did they play out in terms of uh, the work done under the auspices of the university and the work done um, sort of for the institutions and where the bleed sat between them? Yeah. Well, and they're all quite different. With, with, the, with, the, with the fact role, we, we um, hired someone who had been working in Edinburgh um, in the university in the informatics department. Um, and part what we one of the things that we were trying to help kind of fact uh, realise was, was how, you know, fact had been established as a foundation for art and creative technology um, at a time when that meant helping artists to put their videos onto DVDs. Mm -hmm. Um, and had, had you know, developed and was something else now. But one of the things that we were really keen to do was, was to support FACT in being able to work uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of more realistic way with technology and also mm -hmm. to, to, be, to have a bit more muscle in terms of making research funding bids. Mm -hmm. And so the person we appointed there was, was someone who had quite a lot of experience of research funding. And the first thing, you know, within a week of being there, we, or two weeks of being there, we, we, we what we won a bid that was about, uh, it, was, it wasn't a huge, it was a kind of I know, 16,000 pound uh, HRC bid, which is you know, kind of small, but, but it was about uh, outputting, outputting 3D uh, rendered, 3D digital 3D models of shapes that uh, kids were playing with on, uh, not Tetris, but that game that kids play on the iPad where they, they make cities. Minecraft. Minecraft. There you go. Um, and so, and so, and, and that so he, he, we, we got funding to devise that that process, and also host a number of, of uh, workshops in the city where children became involved. And it was really about trying to help children to think about digital aided design. Mm -hmm. um, and that then, and then we built around that we built a centre for digital embodiment, mm -hmm. uh, which was something that we were all concerned to do, which is try and forge a kind of relationship between the digital and the and the real. With mm -hmm. um, the biennial, we appointed a very eminent guy called Joseph Greener. Who was the um, curator who came from Domus, who was the editor of Domus, mm -hmm. um, and he um, was co curator of the Venice Architecture Biennale with Rem Koolhaas. Mm -hmm. um, and his role was that he worked a little bit more on, he, he brought us a, a kind of an amazing uh, lecture program, particularly around kind of architecture and, and built environment, and mm -hmm. started with the biennial, started uh, sort of curatorial projects with them, which were about thinking how a biennial might exist within, within some abandoned houses. Uh, in the city. Mm -hmm. um, now, Anthony Hudek since since left Liverpool, we left, we left pretty much at the same time as, as I did. We appointed his style white leg, kind of more kind of uh, thread. I mean, the thing the thing with these posts is, is that they're recurrent. So one mm -hmm. one of the things that was you know on one level it was the opportunity to bring you know particular people in to do certain projects, but I think the more significant thing is that they're they're on the books, mm -hmm. yeah. so that you know people will come, will go, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the possibility of, of, of filling that post is always there. Some of my colleagues were very sceptical about the idea that people would come for short periods of time. I, I, I completely disagreed. I thought, you know, one, one of the, you know, staff retention is a problem two ways. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's hard to keep staff, and sometimes it's a, it's a problem to, you know, so I thought it was very... <laughs> Nicely stated. <laughs> um, no, but, but it, it, it's, um, you know, there was a sentiment in Liverpool that if you went there, you know, you should stay, and if you went mm. and, and, and left, you were a bit of a flow in. To me, it seemed essential that we developed, you know, a more uh, lively stream of people coming in and out of the institution. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, when I left, I felt very sorry to leave last year. But at the same time, I thought it was, you know, also great for Liverpool that I went on to do the job that I went on to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important for university where people go on. Mm -hmm. Questions, observations. Well, you talked about. Um you know, in terms of a model, thinking about Liverpool, how big is that as a city? But, you know, we come from New Zealand, which is a much smaller um, entity, mm -hmm. so in order yeah. to, to paint a picture about that. Mm -hmm. But also you talked about um, trying to push against the Glasgow model, and I, I just so, wonder if you could talk about what that Glasgow model is that you were... Yeah. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't need to have a go at Glasgow at all, because I, I love Glasgow, I, just, I should say that. But, but I, think, I think there's uh, Glasgow... Uh, sorry... It, it, it's kind of used in the UK as an example of the way in which a city uh, suddenly became uh, you know, a good place for artists to live and work. Uh, and I think it was also uh, <coughs> to do with kind of art school. And, but in a sense, but, but the, but, uh, and, and it, it was a good and very, very effective model and you know, it was great. Uh, 
but in a sense, one of the things about 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 the way in which Glasgow developed it, its kind of arts infrastructure was, uh, on one level, it was heavily funded by by Scotland and the Arts House and the sense of Scottish nets. Um, and then it was also, uh, and I don't mean this critically, but, but, but it developed quite a conventional model of uh, kind of artistic practice and, and exhibition making. So it was very much about kind of curatorial activity, artists being connected to a market, as well as significant kind of public exhibitions. Um, it was quite, uh, you know, it, it was quite conventional in that, in that sense, and it was fine. I think the point I was trying to make was that uh, in, in Liverpool, certainly, we tried to figure out something that seemed relevant to the city. You know, so in a sense, we tried to figure out something that, that made sense in relation to a context that was determined by the immediate uh, financial, uh, economic, uh, social circumstances that, that we found ourselves in, and also a kind of heritage that we recognised the city, the city had. Um, and, and, and I think that's, I think that's, that, I think that's terribly important because I don't think there's. There's a model for these things. I think I think content is the most important thing, um, and I think you know one one has to look at the kind of content that one has in, in place and what what it's kind of important to do in that place. We you know when we were doing all this stuff in Liverpool, we were talking quite a lot to uh, to Grisdale and um, um, Adam and, and Alistair there, who were doing a different thing. So Grisdale is is, is is a is a sorry. It's in, Somehow, it seems so familiar here. I forget sometimes I'm halfway across the world <laughs> in a different context. Um, but Grise there was, 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 a, was an art centre that was established in a very, very small village in the, in the Lake District in the north of England. And the premise that they, that they, that they thought that, that, they, that they kind of worked towards was the idea of how can what we do be useful to here. Um, and here, in their case, meant about 100 people. So they established a kind of art centre in Grise there which had... Uh, you know, international uh, notoriety, uh, but which is really serving a community of about 100 people. Um, so I, I think that's what I meant. But I think, I mean, and I don't know. You know, I, I arrived yesterday in London, so I'd, I'd be mm. really hard pressed to, to say, you know, these seem to be the things that are kind of, you know, urgent and important and kind of useful and interesting to work with here. I think, I think, I think what may be able to be shared is 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 a kind of. Um, is, is, is an approach that, I don't know, it seems obvious really, but, but, but it's kind of enthusiastic and it's kind of ambitious for, I mean, in my, in my case, for the art school to, to be, you know, to be producing at the level that any kind of museum or gallery or other institution of that kind might be, might be producing. Because I, I think I have, I think it's the most effective way of, of teaching artists for them to be involved in the culture, where, which is also kind of producing. But sort of also 2008 Liverpool, um, while it was very focused on the um, capital of culture or city of culture, um, that was a massive injection of funding into an extremely depressed city, um, which was undergoing massive areas of gentrification. So the central city was um, uh, filled with uh, sort of you know derelict buildings or buildings that had you know their, their, their previous use was no longer tenable or viable extraordinary music and kind of rave culture, you know, during the 1990s, but, but it's, a, it's a tense, it was then a tense and troubled place. Yeah. Um, so I think it was, it was a very particular context that, that, that the art school was um, existing within, and, the, and it's a place full of contradictions where you have this plethora of arts institutions that are operating at a particular level, but also, you know... Um, uh, at that, that time, high levels of unemployment, um, yeah. kind of youth malaise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. And I think one of the things, I mean, Tate t- t- Liverpool was, was, was founded really as a kind of regeneration project. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, when, when um, you know, I mean, the documents have shown that the that, that Conservative government at the time was really thinking about closing Liverpool down. So there was, there was discussion in the Cabinet about how do we uh, manage the decline of Liverpool. You know, since it's turned back. Um, and and um, it was Hasseltine actually, it was a minister in the cabinet at the time who had been a property developer, and it was actually through, it wasn't through any kind of uh, benign charitable instinct, but through his kind of property <laughs> developer's eyes that he saw this is a shame because there's this amazing kind of building in Liverpool, let's, let's try and do something with them. And so the Tate Liverpool was founded really on that, on that basis. And it was a gamble. I mean, I went to, there was a lunch a few years ago when I was there, which was the 25th anniversary. Um, and he was asking, you know, how do you know this would work? He said, you have no idea. But he said they applied so much money into all sorts of urban regeneration projects and parks and the gardens, and none of it had worked. So why not? Why not bring a Tate gallery up here? <laughs> <laughs> so it was really a, a gamble. And, and 
you know, to some extent, uh, you know, one narrative is that, that it absolutely worked and it transformed Liverpool and, you know, there's cultural renaissance and, you know, all sorts of things kind of took place. And, and, and yes, of course. Another narrative is that Liverpool remains one of the poorest cities in the UK. Um, you know, significant problems around education, health, etc. Um, and so, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's, it's an interesting kind of context to work in. I think, I think, what, what, I think what had happened at the Arsenal Circle, and I would say, is, is that the Arsenal had um, sort of not quite known what to do with all these kind of huge cultural kind of monuments that had suddenly established themselves in the city. So, you know, what do you do if you're a kind of small art school in a regional city and suddenly you've got to hate, and suddenly you've got to biennial, and you're kind of feeling, on, you know, God, you know, we, we were kind of talking about landscape, or you know, so so I think it kind of it kind of got slightly kind of caught caught up, you know, inside itself. And and I must say, you know, one one of the reasons that we we, we established our city was was that we were kind of noticing that with, with our students, and we you know we were using the you know all these kind of galleries and festivals to attract people to come to the city. But of course, if you're an artist, you know, an undergraduate who's graduating. Uh, in terms of your own career, the biennial and the Tate are not that useful. You know, what, what do you what do you do with that? And, and, and there, was, there was a sense that that, that that actually, you know, one one of the kind of initially impacts of Tate had changed afterwards because I think their activity now, as as the biennial, is much more uh, conscious of the kind of grassroots uh, importance. Uh, but one of the initial kind of uh, uh, impacts was that it sucked a lot of the kind of funding, a lot of the kind of energy of the arts into these very high-level organisations and left kind of this, you know, pretty big gap between them and then, say, an art school. Um, so it was some of that that we were trying to kind of effectively kind of backfill through some of these projects as well. So you know, I'm just, just the fact that you join Post, just the fact that you've got someone walking across town every day, and just the fact that you're not having to kind of think about who do I talk to about this or that, just the fact that any project, you know, suddenly can be picked up and, and, and carried out collaboratively. It's really, it was, it was really, yeah, exciting. I'm interested in this, the, the Artist City initiative and your comment about um, whenever you initiate something that has to have meaning to a place, you, you need to start with the criteria of it um, has to be useful to hear. And that seems like a really wonderful uh, baseline to work from. The Artist City initiative, how did you work out what it was that you wanted to do? Did that come through intuition, consultation, um, in terms of those, I think, five different... Yeah. Because they're not generic, but they're very broad, so I can imagine them kind of working anywhere yeah. in a city that's artist um, population is a bit disenfranchised because it's mm. a poor city. But... I'm, I'm, I guess I'm interested in how yeah. specifically. Yeah. Both intuition and consultation. I mean, the, the first year that I, that I arrived in Liverpool, there was uh, one, one of the things that was pointed to in this report uh, that was written by the arts um, organisations, which the arts you know, had to take, it was quite tough for the arts to take. One of the things that it pointed to uh, in, in turn was the absence of um, a, a kind of homegrown art, art scene in Liverpool. So we were very, Liverpool was understood to be a city that was very good. Uh, and had great resources to display and show art from all over the world, and indeed it did, but it wasn't necessarily generating a great deal of art that was then shown elsewhere in the world. And so, you know, everybody in Liverpool, to some extent, was fixated on those moments in the 60s where we did, you know, produce musicians and uh, people who were doing things significantly across the world. Um, so that was understood. Uh, and the first attempt was, one of the first things that people thought we needed to do was to launch an MA. We didn't have an MA in, in fine art. So we, we wrote, we launched an MA, uh, and the first year, it had okay recruitment to it, about 10 people signed up to it. And the next year, we, we almost had none, because everybody wanted to do NMA had done it. <laughs> um, so it seems it seemed, so that, that was one thing. But then, then the other thing was, okay, how do we make, how do we make this country a kind of more attractive place for artists to come and, and live and work? Mm. Being very conscious as well of, of, of the kind of financial situation in, in, in the UK, meaning that London was becoming ever, ever more expensive. Mm. Um, and so we did that in a number of ways. So there was this, there was this, there was this, you know, this scheme was, was important to try and you know, persuade our best graduates to stay, to stay in the city. Um, we managed to recruit uh, people to the joint posts who, who wouldn't have come otherwise. Um, also, in fact, it, it, we, we managed to work together with some of the organisations to uh, support their recruitment of, of outstanding people to come and work for them because we began to, to make 
you know, the idea of Liverpool exciting, as well as the institutions that were there. So in a sense, you know, people were very, very attracted by this idea that they might be able to work between kind of academia and uh, the cultural sector. You know, people seem to like this idea. Um, in, terms of, in terms of those schemes, um, well, I mean, they, they kind of seemed obvious, really. You know, students, our students were, were graduating and they were going out to Liverpool. They felt quite isolated. A few of them had set up studio blocks but wanted to encourage more of that activity. So that, that made sense of, of, of hunting and packs. You know, hunting and packs was um, actually uh, uh, you know, the idea that artists were not really recognizing the, the, the significance of a kind of peer group. Mm -hmm. And we wanted artists, you know, encourage artists to think about you know, being individuals, but also working collaboratively and working together. You know, they, 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 they probably get a lot further than they would by being on their own. Um, the, the critical writing was, was, was really because, you know, it seemed that there was very little kind of, you know, all, all the, the kind of magazines and publications that existed around the arts in Liverpool were really kind of glorified listings pages. Um, and in a kind of small city, it was quite difficult for people to say things to each other. So that, that seemed an important thing to get, to get going, to have a kind of responsive environment. Um, the artist teacher thing was, was it, it just, that, that was, I suppose, I suppose I had an idea that, you know, when I went to art school, and the, the myth was that you went to art school and had to unlearn everything you'd ever learned before. Um, it, it seemed to me and to a few people in Liverpool that that was just not a tenable position any longer. You know, because it was effectively saying, you know, there's this amount of funding going into someone's education, and they're coming here, we're short of funds, and we're saying, you've got to forget everything, we're going to teach you again. Uh, we started thinking, well, you know, what if, what if we work with schools and, and, and make sure that students, when they're arriving here, um, you know, have a sense of what, of what we need to do? Surely that will kind of save us some, some resource, if not we don't. You know. um, so it was, it, was, it was that, really. It was, it was kind of having been around for a while. But we talked a lot to the Arts Council about it, too, you know, around what, what their priorities might, might be and how we could kind of find a way, a way in between to, to do that. Yes, Tony. Well, I just wonder, I mean, Liverpool, you can discuss, and it's, it's really interesting, and I'm sure a lot of people in New Zealand and in Wellington kind of um, feel quite heartened by what we've been talking about. But I wonder, now that you're at the Royal College, what, what's the difference? What, what's actually the motivation there? It's more affluent. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's, um, I've been there for a year. Um, the, the, I guess, I guess, I guess the, the, the um, I guess the challenges we have at the, at, at the Royal College are, um, well, the challenge I was specifically in fine art that I've been trying to address is how to how to maintain uh, a, a kind of certain. Uh, uh, Excellence in what in what we do in terms of delivery of subject specific programs and painting, sculpture, print making, and photography. Um, how do we carry on doing that, but also address maybe a, a, a kind of suspicion uh, that we have that we need to be a bit more up uh, to date in our in our understanding or our conception of, of, of the fine art practice. Um, so, we've been working in the last year on a new program that's validated now or launched in 2016 called Contemporary Art Practice that will sit alongside the existing programs. Um, and part of that is about trying to think about new, you know, so, so in a sense, uh, whether you're studying painting or printmaking or whatever at the Royal College, you can still do video, or you can do whatever you want in the programmes. Um, but it seems to me that, that, that one, one of the challenges is to say, okay, well, that, that, that may well be the case, but it, it's one thing to uh, kind of give people licence to do whatever they want, and, but it seems quite a different thing to support it, because generally if you're you know, a student in a painting programme and you decide that you're going to make video, you're generally still be taught by, 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 by people who, do, who, are, who are painters. Um, so on one level, it's, it's around how we support those practices better. Uh, but I think on, a, on, a, on another level, it's about making a kind of statement, kind of more publicly or more broadly, um, about the fact that we are interested in supporting practices not in relation to existing and dominant discourses of practice, uh, but in relation to new and emerging ways of thinking about practice. So, for example, our, our students, who, we have a performance pathway and that's important because our performance students, on the whole, um, are not interested in, in performance as uh, an element within the expanded field of sculpture. You know, they're interested in performance because they've grown up uh, engaged with social media, self-imaging, uh, 
things like this that lead them to, to lead them to kind of think about performance as a really kind of appropriate way for them to be artists equally with you know video. People are not making video as an extension of the colour field of painting. They may you know they, they may have no conception and never touch the painting. You know, so in a sense, of, so so what we're quite interested to do is how we can begin to engage uh, with with kind of new, they're not even so new. Uh, but you know, forms of working that are maybe less materially bound, mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't always kind of draw those things back into the material kind of binding. Um, there's a kind of aspect of, of, um, of yeah, thinking about that. You know, I think it relates to kind of colonial discourses. So how can we, you know, think? Of, you know, there's a lot of work being done on the decolonisation of museum culture. I think there's significant work to be done on on, on a kind of decolonisation of art school culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, what are the models that drive us to do what we do? There's, 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 there's you know, there's a, they, our school culture is still very, very patriarchal, I think. Um, and I think there's quite a lot to do to, to, to try and kind of challenge that and fix it. So I think the contemporary art practice program is, is, is one way of beginning to think about, um, you know, how we can address that. Um, so other things that, you know, around, I mean, boring things, you know, in fine art, had to facilitate a, a discussion around fine art that transcends the, the various kind of material focuses that people have, while allowing that to, to continue as well. Um, so that, that, that they're the kind of you know they're the kind of significant challenges. And another huge challenge as well, of course, at the moment is 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 is, is the financial situation mm -hmm. because government funding is, is is changing quite dramatically. We've got you know conservative administration now who will um, uh, champion kind of more private funding around around art schools today. The budget. Well, the budget happened yesterday, mm -hmm. and, and you know it, it's clearly the beginning of, of, of uh, more work towards decreasing the, the reliance on, on public funding for students. Um, that's going to be very challenging over the next uh, over the next over the next few years. Collaboration is different in in, in London, I'm finding because because there's a different kind of um, London has a different kind of resilience. Uh, so this idea that that we need to work together, uh, you know. Urgently and kind of radically, it's not. It's not quite the same. But um, I've been starting to, to work uh, uh, with um, the London School of Economics, um, uh, precisely around this idea of London, because we don't, you know, we don't talk about London in London in the way that we used to about Liverpool in Liverpool. And I think we probably need to begin to kind of think about that quite, quite significantly more. Is London English or is it a city of the world? Uh, both. Mm. Yeah. And in terms of currently um, within the School of Fine Art, the ratio of international students to domestic students, how, where's that currently it's quite, sitting? It's quite it's low for, for, for kind of postgraduate institutions. So mm. we have about 35% um, kind of overseas non EU students, mm. um, which is a limit that's set by, our, by the Royal College Council. Mm. Um, and most of the average, the average in the UK for postgraduate tour provision is about 60% uh, um, kind of non EU. And you were saying that the ratio of um, masters to uh, doctoral study is about um, doctoral study about 15%? Yes, so the School of Fine Arts is about 300 students, and it's about yeah. 270 doing MAs, and about 30 uh, PhD students. Mm. Just, just sort of Great. Okay, I think we're going to draw it to a close there, folks, as I'm sure everyone's bellies are starting. Thank you, Juan, for this really rich presentation.